Hi, David. Hello. I uh, just want to give the floor to you. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, oops, wrong button. Uh, where's my here? Okay, is my screen visible? Okay, good. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Dr. David ben Ramon, and I am a psychiatry resident at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. So it's a bit early for me. I apologize uh, <laughs> if, if I look tired at all. Um, and uh, I'm also the chief science officer at Aphrid Health. Aphrid is a digital mental health company that focuses on building clinical decision support systems for clinicians and patients dealing with different mental health conditions, starting with depression. We're also a finalist in the IBM Watson AI X Prize, and uh, that will be being decided later this month. Uh, as a disclaimer, of course, uh, given that I do have a commercial affiliation, you shouldn't trust anything I say because never trust anybody affiliated with the company. Um, that being said, I'll do my best uh, to, uh, to talk about what we do and why we do it and how it works. Um, so really, uh, this will be about building a clinical decision support system for depression treatment using artificial intelligence and the interface between medicine and technology. Um, so what we're trying to do really is we are trying to help uh, improve a significant problem that exists, which is that in the treatment of many mental health conditions, but starting with depression, so we'll talk about depression, um, it is very difficult to uh, manage patients' treatments and select the appropriate treatment for a given patient. So the, um, there are dozens of existing treatments for the, for the treatment of depression. Well, over a dozen, not dozens. Um, all the first-line treatments are about equally effective. So whether you're looking at psychotherapy or different medications, they're all about equally effective. Um, Equally effective isn't great because only about a third of people will actually respond to the first treatment they try. And there's 320 million people at any given time who have depression. It's the number one cause of disability around the world. It costs the world a trillion dollars a year and obviously significant amounts of suffering for uh, patients and their families. So the problem is that um, we have a lot of people with depression. It takes a long time to treat them. Most of them have to try multiple things, which just doubles or triples the length of the treatment you need. And no one really has a, a, a consistent and coherent way to help select between the available treatments. Because we do know that certain people do better with certain things than others. We just don't know how to predict it. Um, and um, we also uh, need help managing uh, patient treatments. So there's guidelines that exist on the management of treatment. So when you switch medication, when you increase the dose, when you add psychotherapy, all of these things, but people don't, doctors don't have time to follow these guidelines because they're a hundred pages long and going back to them each time is difficult, which each with each patient you see, especially for, for family doctors and general practitioners who are the frontline uh, uh, staff when it comes to treating depression. So most patients with depression are, never see a psychiatrist or even a psychologist. They mostly see their family doctor. Um, so what we've built is a physician-patient software platform. So both patients and physicians get access. Um, it provides for the patient a way to respond to questionnaires, to track their symptoms, to track their treatment, to see how they're doing, which is actually helpful for, helpful for patients because a lot of patients who experience uh, depression just don't remember or know how they've been doing because part of the condition is that your attention isn't great so you don't really notice when things are better or worse um or you're more likely to notice when things are worse than when things are better so having access to a graph of your symptoms over time actually people really appreciate that and they like that um but that's been done before so symptom tracking is not new what we've added is we operationalized via what's basically an expert system um, the best practice guidelines that exist. Um, and then we added on top of that a deep neural network that uses existing uh, data from over 10,000 patients 
to personalize the treatment based on simple clinical and demographic features. Now, this is important because um, biomarkers uh, such as genetics are still in their infancy. Uh, we don't understand them well. We don't know that they're better than the other than the questionnaire-based measures. Um, most of the digital uh, phenotyping that exists is validated against questionnaires anyway, and the questionnaire is often just faster to collect. Um, so we haven't yet moved into the biomarkers or digital phenotyping yet because the science isn't quite good enough yet for actual deployment, and we wanted to build something that could be deployed in clinics um, and put through clinical trials and actually you know, be approved for use with patients, which... Uh, I will talk to you a little bit about our experience actually treating patients with the system. Um, so that's why you won't see any fancy genetics or brain scans or anything like this. Also, genetics and brain scans are expensive and, un and inaccessible. So if we want to reach the maximum number of people, um, we really need to have something that is easy for a patient to complete in the waiting room and then the, the physician will have the results right away. So. Symptom tracking, on top of that, you've got the best practice guidelines to help manage the treatment. And on top of that, you've got the AI that helps select the treatment. All of this is meant to assist the clinician and the patient um, and the clinician in their clinical decision making. It does not replace the physician. The patient does not self-diagnose. They don't self-manage. They don't self-treat for legal and ethical reasons um, that we can get into later. But basically, it's really about supporting this shared decision making between physician and patient. Um, the idea is to get to higher rates of remission, so higher rates of people becoming symptom free, and to reduce the time um, to remission, so to make it faster for people to get to remission. Um, so I will focus on the AI model. Obviously, there's a lot more to the system than just the AI because the whole thing has to work together as a cohesive platform for people to use it and therefore to, for it to have an impact. Um, but basically, um, we use the neural network. Uh, we did that because we believed, and so far we seem to be correct, that there are complex nonlinearities uh, in the data. Um, they outperform other methods at large n, um, that's been shown consistently, and they improve modularity so that we can incorporate biomarkers eventually, but not yet. Um, we used high quality data from clinical trials. So data that actually includes both patients baseline information before treatment and then information at the end of treatment is very rare. Medical records generally don't include outcome measures for mental health, um, and I just don't trust a lot of the proxy measures that you can use because they don't necessarily tell you about um, the patient's actual symptom status at the end of treatment uh, if it's not measured directly um, without including a whole bunch of other biases that you need to account for. So we do not use medical records, and we don't use stuff scraped from the internet because the data just isn't there. We really needed data about starting treatment, end of treatment. Um, so we used, we needed, and we needed high quality data with, with low missingness and things like that. So we use clinical trial data. Clinical trials have issues, obviously, um, but the majority of the clinical trials that we have used have actually been from trials that have fairly um, loose inclusion and exclusion criteria, which means that they're fairly representative of a real population, more so than other clinical trials outside of depression, I would say. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's the best we can get. It was either this or super biased data uh, that we would have had to account for, a huge number of biases uh, that, that are difficult to account for. Not impossible, but difficult. Um, these came from university hospital research sites, uh, institutions, and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, through open access portals. So we have no official relationship with any pharma companies. We are not funded by, by pharma companies, um, but uh, they, they provide data access to researchers if you ask for it. So that's what we did. Um, so far, we've used about 10,000 patient records for the current model of nearly 50,000 obtained. Uh, why did we use all 50,000? Well, because half of those are placebo. Um, which was not necessary for our model, and the other, and a bunch of other uh, factors came in. We had too much of some drugs, for example, so we didn't need all of the data from for those. And we had, uh, there's also just a question of data quality. Sometimes patients have too much missing data to be to be useful. Um, 
the model is currently being expanded. So we should be getting to about 15,000 uh, patients before we get to our clinical trial. And once uh, marketed, the AI will be able to improve over time. But that's actually a very interesting and complicated regulatory question that if anybody's curious, you could ask about after. So the model currently covers 10 frontline medications. Uh, the, and the 11th medication is being added. We have plans next to move to add-on treatments and, um, and therapy. Why didn't we start with therapy? Because there is not a lot of available uh, in digital format um, high quality data about therapy. Therapy is, is very well validated, but the studies are either old or small uh, compared to medication studies because there's less money behind therapy. So um, it's we've been working very, very hard on finding good data sets for therapy, but it's very difficult, which is why we don't have it in, in the system uh, as part of the AI system yet. It is part of the, the system in terms of the um, the standard treatment recommendations. So, so uh, that's that's that. But it's not because we don't like therapy. We love therapy. We just have to be smart about what data we're using. Um, we then perform feature selection. We bring hundreds of variables down to between fifteen and thirty. All of this is simple demographic uh, or clinical information. We train a neural network. We output uh, remission probability as our main objective for the model. Um, at the same time, though, the model is learning about the treatments the patient has received. So we always force the treatment perceived to be a feature in the model. Um, and then with new patients coming in, we run each possible treatment through the patient given their baseline characteristics, which changes the remission probability uh, that, that it outputs, which allows for basically a ranked list of remission probabilities for different treatments, um, which then helps the clinician and the patient make a more informed decision about what treatment to try first or second. Um, and each probability that we produce for each drug, for each patient, has an interpretability report that tells clinicians the features most important behind each prediction. Um, we tested the AI models using a number of different metrics, uh, standard metrics like the sensitivity, specificity, MPV, AUCs, our AUCs run between 0.6 and 0.8, usually in the high 0.6s, low 0.7s, which in this kind of uh, model for this kind of data is actually fine. Um, but that's not the real test of this model. And that's important to understand because if all I did was predicted what patients would do well and what patients wouldn't do well, even if I predicted that perfectly, but I can't do anything to alter that probability, it's not particularly useful, right? If I could tell a cancer patient, for example, the precise probability that they will die, but I have no way of influencing that probability, no one is gonna wanna use my system because it's just depressing. It's predicting doom is what we call it. Um, so if I were to tell a patient, you have a 30% chance of not responding to treatment, and they say, great, what can I do to, 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 to improve my chances? And I said, I have no idea. My system would be useless. So. What we do is we test the system to see if it can actually, by using it in simulations, do we think we'll be able to increase the number of people who will do well by better targeting the treatment. And so that we can do. And that's actually quite impressive data that we have. So um, we do that in two ways. One is what we call a naive uh, uh, model, where we basically take a holdout set of patients, we run the model on them, we take the highest predicted treatment for each one, we average those together, and we compare it to the baseline remission probability, and we see if there's a delta. So do we see that the remission probability is better for patients who, who theoretically are going to get what the model predicts as opposed to whatever they were randomized to? A conservative analysis, which we also have, is basically where we run our, our data 10,000 times in 10,000 bootstrap samples. Um, and then in each uh, sample, we look and see if the patient got who patients who got in real life what we say they should have gotten do better on average than the patients who did not get what we say they should have gotten. So it's a factual analysis because we're looking it, it's vertical because we're looking at the patients who did get what we say they should have gotten compared to those who didn't. We have to do the bootstrapping because there's not that many patients who get what we say they should have gotten by chance, right? Because it's, it's randomized. Um, so we look and see if that does better than the population average and we generate a p-value because of the distribution and that tells us if we're better than random, better than random, random allocation, um, which we are uh, quite significantly, which is cool. 
Um, and uh, we also test for things like ethnicity and other biases to make sure that the model hasn't learned and worsened existing biases. So it's fine actually for the model to exhibit certain uh, biases because unfortunately certain demographic features do impact remission rate. So, you know, uh, being non-white does have an impact on remission rate because the world is a terrible place. Um, we wouldn't want to not capture that because then we're going to be over optimistic and people who might need more support aren't going to get it. But we don't want to over or underestimate people's chances of doing well. So we wouldn't want the system to say, if you're not white, you're going to do 40% worse than everyone else when really it's you're going to do 10% worse than everyone else. So we check to make sure that whatever it's learned is reflective of the underlying data and that it hasn't amplified any biases, which is important, but not that it's ignored or whitewashed the, the data either, which is very important. Um, yeah. So the other point to make here is that, yes, we definitely are doing a comparison to clinical trials where patients are either all getting the same thing or all being randomized to different things. But in the, in the end of the day, it's not a bad comparator to clinical practice because clinical practice essentially is whatever the doctor happens to randomly be comfortable with is what you're going to get. So whatever they're used to prescribing is what you're going to get prescribed from them. They don't necessarily tailor the treatment based on individual patients very much. They're going to prescribe whatever they're used to prescribing. Um, and this has been, you know, described many times. So random allocation is not a bad comparator to actual practice uh, at the end of the day. So we actually tested this platform in vivo with people, actual human beings, which is fun. Um, we tested it uh, with the AI integrated with 20 physicians in a simulation center. So uh, that's a, uh, a fun place where you get to watch uh, doctors and simulated patients uh, via a one-way mirror interacting with the system. We did three scenarios at the Sim Center, and we demonstrated that physicians can use the system in 10 minutes. Uh, the majority found it easy to use and trustworthy, and we learned about how to optimize training for physicians uh, to improve the physician-patient interaction. Importantly, having the AI in the room didn't scare people or make them uh, not trust their doctor anymore or anything like that. We then did a feasibility study. So this is in the real, real world with real patients and real doctors, seven psychiatrists and family doctors and 17 patients, 14 people who completed the study over three visits. This was, this was during COVID. So our numbers were a bit lower than we wanted them to be because COVID was happening. Um, so this was over three visits, uh, a baseline visit and two visits with the tool. And the main outcome was the length of an appointment with your doctor. Um, and that did not change. And the reason that our main outcome was length of appointment with your doctor is because all the doctors we spoke to had one question to start with, is this going to make my appointment longer? And this is important because doctors have been given more and more and more technology, all of which has tended to, because it hasn't been optimized, just add time and increase burnout rates. So it was actually quite important for us to prove to doctors that it doesn't take more time to use the system than just doing your regular practice. And a lot of doctors actually appreciated not having to do all the data collection themselves, that the system would collect data from patients about their, their symptoms and things, and then they'd be able to just focus on what was important instead of asking all of the basic questions every single time. So it didn't change the length of sessions, which means that it's feasible to use in clinical practice. This is a uh, pretty uh, poster that we published recently um, showing a few different things. So you can see here that um, the, uh, the appointment time um, was, not, um, was not longer between sessions. So this was a baseline visit before the tool was introduced and then visit one, visit two. 92% um, of patients found the system easy to use. 71% of doctors found the system easy to use. Um, and uh, this is including some physicians who are quite, were quite technologically um, not inclined. So people, we expressly tried to recruit physicians who had, who were more used to using paper and pencil and very basic computer applications, just to see if we could get the system, if it get them to use the system. And we could, which was very exciting. And the, my favorite uh, result, well, I mean, there's a few different results I like in this in this study, but one of my favorites is that is the, uh, the physician-patient relationship. So the patients rated how their relationship with their physician changed as a result of using the, the app. And in fact, um, 
we had uh, 30 point seven for so, well basically almost 50 percent um, who said that the, the relationship actually improved in some way and 50 percent who said that it didn't change didn't change is fine I'm not I didn't build this system to improve necessarily um, it, it wasn't an endpoint that it had to improve relationship but it had to at least not make it worse and sometimes make it better which is what happened so it actually having the AI in the room with the patient and the physician didn't it worsened the relationship, but either it had no effect, which is fine, or it made it better, which is good. And patients were pretty good at completing their questionnaires, um, which is also nice. So um, we will now move on to the clinical trial. So we're actually planning a clinical trial now with these feasibility results demonstrating that our system um, is usable and user-friendly and doesn't you know, kill people on contact or anything crazy like that. Um, we have uh, started uh, work on putting in place a clinical trial that we can use to get FDA and Health Canada approval. Um, it's going to be um, uh, at a number of different sites in the U.S. and Canada, um, 350 patients with a 50-50 allocation to treatment and placebo, and the study design has been extensively discussed with the FDA and approved by Health Canada. Um, the primary endpoint is going to be look at remission rates between groups, and the secondary endpoints, there's a bunch of them. We have a clinical trial identifier. You can look it up on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, it's a prospective active control trial. So the control group is going to be physicians who get access to questionnaire results and training on guidelines, but do not get access to the app. Um, patients will be blinded. They won't know if they're in the active or the control group. They won't know what the other group gets. Um, it's rater blinded um, so that the study outcomes will be evaluated by a blinded rater. And it's partially blinded. The it's also physician partially blinded. So doctors will not know how good we expect the AI to be compared to the other thing. And they also won't know um, uh, the, uh, the specific measure of the endpoint. So they won't know, they won't be able to sort of unconsciously encourage their patient towards a particular set of symptoms that would improve the endpoint. Um, this is to avoid some expectation bias on the part of physicians. And then the physician is the is the one being randomized, not the patient. And then the patients follow their physician into whatever arm the physician is randomized. We're planning to initiate this uh, quarter three, quarter four, 2021. Uh, the individual participants will be in the study for 12 weeks, which is three months, which is a standard depression treatment time. Um, we will be recruiting patients for six months. That way, the last patient who comes in at month six uh, will be done by month nine. Um, a study data will be available about 12 months after the patient is in, and then we'll have a regulatory review period after that to get our approval so we can provide this thing uh, outside of clinical trials to patients. Here's a bunch of publications. And that's it. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, I actually have, um, first of all, I have a question about from Eve Lee. I, I think you pronounce it like that. She was wondering if like the, the poster that you showed us with the study, uh, like the complete information of the study, if you were a, be able to uh, share that. It um, should be online somewhere. If you can find it, then you can email me and I'll send it to you. Okay. But it should be online okay. somewhere. Okay, it was a, will, uh... we presented it at the Society of Biological Psychiatry, um, SOBP, uh, recently. Mm -hmm. So it should be online. If you cannot find it, please message me. Okay, I will definitely look into that in the, in the meantime. Um, so the second question is, uh, could you please explain uh, what all things a patient can track? So, well, yeah, so I, that was it's... at the beginning. Uh, sure. Yeah. There, there's a, a bunch of things. Um, we have a standard set of things, which is basically depression, anxiety, side effects. Um, and then you can add on uh, drug use, alcohol use. You can add on uh, general wellness. You can add on burnout. You can add on um, disability. So how much your symptoms are impacting your ability to do social and other activities. There's a whole bunch of different pieces that can be added on. Um, but that's kind of the, you can modify it so that there's a basic set, but you can add things. 
And if a particular clinic likes to keep track of a specific measure, then we can um, we can add that as well. So oh, sleep, for example, we have a specified sleep scale too. So there's a few different things that uh, the patient can track. Um, it's all standardized. So we don't have, uh, in a lot of mood tracking apps will have like these non-standardized sort of simple questions like, how was your sleep today? Or how many minutes do you think you slept? And that's fine. And probably in the future, we will add some of those, but we wanted to start off with standardized questionnaires for two reasons. One, they're standardized so that what we get, we know is more valid than just whatever the patient responds. Uh, physicians are used to it. Systems actually can accept them as outcomes. Um, and also, uh, there usually you have some kind of assurance that you're not going to be asking a question in a way that only applies to a certain segment of the population. They're generally validated in large population samples. So um, there's a few different reasons why. Yeah. We will eventually probably also allow physicians and patients to uh, and this is an eventual thing to generate their own measures. Um, but again, we're not at the phase where that makes sense yet, because right now we really need to have good data in a standardized way on how people are doing with the system. Eventually we can do that. But if we had that now, it would confuse a bunch of the data we're collecting in clinical studies. So, yeah. Um, yeah, there are some more questions popping up, so I will just uh, keep uh, telling mm -hmm. you. Um, so another one is, uh, do you expect important differences between a population of different countries? Yes. And if, uh, if you get so, FDA approval for US and Canada, and how far do you think these results would be extended to other countries? So the best estimate we have is our data is mostly from Western Europe and North America, just because that's where clinical trials for depression are done most of the time. Um, not because we, we didn't want other country data, it just it didn't exist. Uh, there are some from Asia. We have some from Asia, but the majority of it is North, is North America and Western Europe. And therefore, I believe that it'll be pretty applicable to North America, Western Europe, maybe Eastern Europe, but we'd have to see. Um, so once we get U North America and FDA, we can apply for EU and, and, and UK regulation as well. Um, outside of that, what we'll need to do is to see if the system appropriately predicts populations in other countries. And if it doesn't, we'll have to collect data there to uh, adjust for it. So, you know, depression does express itself differently in different places. So I work up north in, in northern Quebec um, with Inuit populations, for example. And the way that depression is expressed uh, in those communities and the symptoms that are experienced are very different. It just looks different. Um, you know, uh, now, is that the symptoms that are presenting? And then if you were to actually do the standardized questionnaires, things would end up the same, possibly. Um, there definitely has been global um, sort of uh, validation of a number of questionnaires that are used for depression. Um, so it's possible that we could take the system to, let's say, you know, I don't know, Brazil um, and, and apply it and see if, uh, if the system is as valid there as it is here. But we'd have to check for ethical reasons. Um, and uh, if it didn't, we would then need to proceed to the step of collecting more data locally to supplement our existing data. And so the system would then have a localized version um, that, uh, that would be appropriate for that jurisdiction. So there are going to be regional differences. Um, we don't know exactly where yet, but North America, U.S., uh, uh, Canada, um, what's it called, uh, Western Europe, U.K., probably most of Central Europe as well, um, would all be fine uh, for now. But we do want to obviously serve other populations, and that will require a little bit more work. For your uh, very clear answer. <laughs> um... So, um, would changing the first recommended drug base on a pro personal profile require changing the guidelines, or as clinicians say, free to choose choose at the moment as well? Great question. So, no, it wouldn't require changing the guidelines. The guidelines say try one of these twelve things. Um, we're just helping you choose which of those twelve things. So, our system is very, very carefully constructed to fit within the guidelines. We don't have, you don't have to do anything outside the guidelines to use our system. Um, we do make some, some predictions for things that would be 
at the second phase of treatment, they're still within the guidelines. They're just at the second phase of treatment, and the clinician has to know what they're doing if they want to use the uh, the combination treatments that exist. They're still within the guidelines, just generally when the patient is a little bit sicker. Um, but um, but no, you don't have to change the guidelines, uh, thankfully. Uh, what might change if we do well in the clinical trial, fingers crossed, is the guidelines might end up incorporating the recommendation that a system like this be used during initial treatment. But the guidelines themselves, the system fits into them very nicely uh, on purpose. Uh, we, in fact, one of the members of our scientific advisory board is one of the authors of the guidelines. Um, so we're very careful about this. Yeah. Okay. And then final question, maybe another question will pop up. Um, if you have any questions, please ask them now. Uh, but I will move on to the last one that I have over here. So how did you convince the physicians to use AI on practice? Which I think is a very interesting question. <laughs> So they didn't really require much convincing. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is that we chose a thing that doctors are bad at and that they can admit that they're bad at. So there's two things here. When, you, when you're building something for doctors, you have to A, help them with something they have trouble with and also help them with something they can admit they have trouble with. Because doctors, and I'm speaking as one, we are very proud. We do not like to admit that we're bad at anything. So some things we admit that we're bad at, we know we're bad at, evidence shows that we're bad at, and we don't have another tool to do it, right? So this system fulfills a very particular need. It's very specific. It's one particular decision. It doesn't try and do anything else. It doesn't try and usurp the doctor's role in any other way. It really fills a particular need. And it's need the doctors themselves identified when we were asking them about this before we even built the system. So we did, of course, you know, we met with people to talk about what they thought was necessary. And this is something the doctors brought up themselves. Oh, if only I had something that could help me select which antidepressant, that we're like, great, I'm happy to hear you say that. So um, it doesn't require much convincing of the value of the system. What requires convincing is that the system is built in a boring UX way well enough to not annoy them. So if you can prove to them that you won't annoy them, they'll use it because they know they need it. So we just have to prove that it wasn't annoying to use, which we have done. Um, and we've learned a lot about how to make it even less annoying, which is great. Um, but but really it was, all, it was all about not irritating the physicians um, more than convincing them that AI is something safe and easy, you know. They, they even said, the focus for them has always been more on, is it easy to use? Is it feasible? Can it integrate into my clinical practice more than, well, what about the AI and how did you train it and this and that and the other? Um, they seem to want very simple, clear explanations about where the data came from, what kind of uh, data it was, how much of it you have, and the basics of that. They're, they're on average less interested in all the intricacies of the AI. We even asked, well, we didn't ask actually, the, the X Prize came uh, to do videos before the finalist competition um, to take some video of, of us. And we had to meet a bunch of clinicians we work with. And one of them asked the clinician, do you think doctors should have AI courses because this is coming? And he's like, listen, no, I don't. There's so many technologies. We can't be experts on everything. Um, we should know, we should be involved in the development of artificial intelligence. That way, when the thing comes to market, it's done properly. But usually what we need is, is to have clinicians who can use the interface more than we need clinicians who can understand all the intricacies of AI. Obviously, as a clinician who understands the intricacies of AI, I, I, I have my own view on that. And I think it would be great if doctors knew everything about AI. Um, but just to give you a sense, the doctors aren't inherently afraid of artificial intelligence at all. Um, they're really just, uh, they just want something that isn't going to give them a headache um, and that will be useful, and that is validated. They they want they do want this to be validated in clinical trials. They want this to be validated by appropriate regulatory authorities. They want to know that what they're getting has gone through the same, you know, rigorous scientific process as like a, a new drug or another device. Um, but they're not inherently more afraid of AI, I find, than they're inherently afraid of a new drug class or a new device or whatever. Uh, they're just afraid of time burden, which is why we had to do all the work we, we did. 
actually like I have another question which came in when you were talking, which I think is very like relevant, and I think you mm-hmm. already somewhat answered it because it's like will your system be explainable or just another black box? But I think you already like explained that uh, doctors uh, can work with it, understand it. So, but can you elaborate on the, on maybe sure the yeah um, yes. Yeah, so we do have a um um a focus on interpretability. Um, It's a very important part of what we do actually. And it's also where we're developing a lot of new methods and and IP. Um, Because doctors do appreciate having interpretability. And we found that it does predict their trust in the system, which in turn predicts their likelihood of using the recommendations that are generated. Um, so another back of the suggestions, the information that is generated, we don't call them recommendations for legal reasons. Um, so the interpretability is important. We already have an interpretability, uh, system in, in the product, uh, from the beginning, um, where for each drug and each prediction, you get a list of the most important features for that prediction, specifically for that patient. So of the 20 things available, what were the top two or three or four or five that had the most weight in this particular prediction for this particular treatment for this particular patient. And if you look at one of our papers, you can actually get an example of that. And we, we, we kind of discuss why that prediction makes sense and how this information, I didn't even cherry pick the result. I just asked for two random cases and it came out and, 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 and there it was. Um, so for example, you know, uh, if one of the drugs is particularly good for patients who want to avoid weight gain or who have a tendency to overeat, um, that happened to be one of the, the predictors that came out as being positive and important for that patient for that drug. And I said, well, you know, this is an association we know about. And clinicians know these things and they can look and, oh, okay, so this is because of this and this and this. And they ma- it makes sense to them. It's the same approach that we use in medicine already, which is lists of risk and protective factors, right? So that's already a very commonly used uh, information conceit in medicine. A doctor may not know how a linear regression model works or a logistic regression model works. They may not know what a beta coefficient is, or they they would they did at some point because they had to pass, you know, basic stats to pass medicine. But 30 years down the line, they're going to forget what a beta is. Um, but you tell them the factors that were predictive of good response were this, 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 and this, and the factors that were predicted better, this, 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 and this. And then, okay, so that makes sense. I have a list of things. I can sort of see why this makes sense. It's fine, and and that's generally sufficient to help physicians understand. However, we are working on adding new techniques. So, for example, one thing that we're working on publishing now is um, taking a cluster approach. So, instead of saying here's a list of things, um, risks and benefits, you look at um, well, can we cluster them um, such that you understand if your patient is you know, closer to this cluster of patients, closer to this cluster of patients, closer. So is your patient like this kind of patient? And that's the other approach in medicine. So either you have a list or you have subgroups. Um, So we're going to have both options available to physicians in the near future uh, to help improve uh, interpretability. So we work very, very hard to have interpretability that is both accessible to the physician so they can understand it and use it, uh, and also, you know, valid and, and scientifically meaningful. Um, and, and that's an interesting balance to try and, and hit, because if your interpretability is too complicated and, and involved, people won't understand it. So an engineer might be like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. And the doctor's like, I, I don't know, no idea what this is. This is less interpretable to me than this. Um, so it's always this interesting dance between what uh, a clinician is expecting and what makes sense in the clinician's mind and what an engineer might generate when you ask about interpretability or explainability so it's it's a fun it's a fun dance um, i saw that we are already very much over time but i think we had some very interesting questions and i uh, would like to thank you for first of all your presentation but also answering them i think that also helped with clarifying some things uh, regarding the poster and presentation i saw some people who were interested in it uh, after the event, we will make a combination of all the presentations that happened today, and uh, we will send that to every participant. So in that way, you will receive all the information uh, from this pre- presentation as well. 
and I will include the poster uh, in that as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for coming, uh, David. My pleasure. And, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it.